I'll be uh, reading from the book of Obadiah this morning, and that's one of those that uh, is kind of difficult to find, Daniel, uh, Amos, Obadiah. It's a very small book, um, one of them they call the minor prophets, and I don't think they were minor, it's just they weren't as well winded as some of the others. There was less material in their, uh, in their recordings. Uh, also, while you're turning there, again, uh, remember me always um, uh, that I would be found preaching what the Lord would have me to preach. And um, uh, if I'm that, if I'm there, then everything is okay. Obadiah chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in verse 8. Obadiah chapter 1 and verse 8. The Bible says, Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom, and, un and understanding out of the mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Taman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob Shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In, in the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gate, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on that day of thy brother, in the day that he became a stranger, Neither shouldest thou rejoice over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither should thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered in the gate of my people in the day of their calamity, yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou uh, neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape, neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. Well, he really preaching from verse 14, uh, thou stood in the crossway. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for all your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for New Testament Baptist Church and for bringing us safe this far. We give you the praise for that. God, this morning we'd ask that your divine Holy Ghost would come on this place in a unique and unusual way, Lord, that we might learn and glean from your Word of God. God, we pray for the lost. Uh, be merciful unto them this morning. Uh, speak life to their hearts. Wake them up to the way of uh, of destruction that lies ahead of them if they're not saved. God, help us together as a people, and we be give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, maybe some not-so-familiar verses, because again, Obadiah is a very, a very short book in the Bible, just a, a one chapter that we read a portion of, and uh, sometimes why I think that people don't maybe read it more is because it's about destruction. Yeah, you know, people don't like to hear that character of God that brings destruction. Right. They like the warm fuzzies and praise God that He is a near God, He's a loving God, but always remember that that love does not extend to everybody. And we live in a day and age where people have so minimized the love of God that you can take it up like you take up a chocolate bar and eat it. That is not the love of God that the Bible teaches. Now, in this instant, Esau had to be dealt with. Now, if you remember, the Bible says very clearly, Esau have I loved and Jacob have I hated. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, well, that just meant he loved him less. No. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says this. It rains on the just 
and the unjust. And just because Esau survived till he was old don't mean that God loved him. And so we, we find there in, in the word of God that this issue between Esau and Jacob still had to be dealt with. And this was some 800 years later, maybe more than that. And they still had to be dealt with in that indecision between them. Verse 8 says, Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount, uh, the mount of Esau? Now, I want you to see the first thing that God was going to bring destruction was their understanding. Now Esau, despite his faults, at one time had an understanding there was a mighty God in heaven. Uh, I really believe he wouldn't even have buried his father in the way that he did if he didn't know something about God. Because if he didn't, he wouldn't have even met with Jacob to bury him. And so we find then that Jacob wasn't completely ignorant of God. And you know what? There's a lot of people today that play the ignorance card, but when they stand before the Almighty, ignorance is not going to be an excuse. Yeah. And so we find then that this judgment uh, was going to be on Esau, Esau, and he said, Shall I not destroy them? But well, why did he have to destroy them? Because of his own righteousness. Because God is holy. And he will not allow sin into the camp. Verse 9. And thy mighty men, O Taman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. So the first judgment came with their understanding. The second ju judgment said that they would be dismayed. Now, dismayed is a type of fear. Uh, it ain't always where they could lay the fear to a certain cause, but they're in dismay. If you remember, I think it's in the book of, uh, of um, Jacob. Jacob cries out and the enemy, the enemy became dismayed. They couldn't find him. And, and, and so we find then that here in the word of God, their second judgment was to be dismayed, to be fearful, to be fearful without cause even. So they were going to be, uh, they were going to be lack understanding, and boy, were there. They, and then they were going to lie, be dismayed where they were at. Verse 10, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Now, Thy brother Jacob, again, is back to Esau's descendants. See, the real judgment wasn't for Taman, and the real judgment wasn't necessarily for Edom. It was the fact that Taman, Edom, and Esau's descendants were all hanging together. Have you ever thought about the group of friends you have and who you hang with? See, because of who Esau hung with, Taman and Edom was going down too. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, what God says is fair, and what you think is fair is two totally different things. And, and so we find then that because of who they uh, associated with, Esau's friendly nations, they were going down as well. And why? Because how he had treated Jacob. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side. <laughs> Who I could preach all day on that, standing on the other side. What a wonder, I really wanted to preach on that, but God wouldn't let me. And, and so you be very careful about where you're standing yeah. this morning. If you're standing, you know what? If you're standing on the other side, you're standing with the enemies of God. Do you know who, who one of the enemies of God, listen, they're about to take over is the Sodomites, and if we don't call them out, we're standing with them. Yeah. And, and, and so we find then, you know what, nothing makes me sicker than that Sodomite running for president kissing on that other man yeah. in public TV. It makes me sick to my yeah. stomach. Yeah. And you know what, 
if we don't stand, we're not able to verbalize that. We're like, well, I know that ain't right, but what can I say? You're standing with it. Just like, just like the Edomites did. They were standing with uh, Esau, so they was going down too. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away, uh, carried away captive his forces, meaning Jerusalem, meaning Israel, and the foreigners entered the gates and cast, uh, uh, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, who would get the main city, even though even thou was as one of them. Now, why were they like one? Why did they, why did they blend in? Because they hung out with them. Verse 12, But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother, in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. I want you to see as they was going down, uh, those descendants of Esau was woohoo! I'm glad they're gone. They finally got what was coming to him. He stole my birthright, and now his descendants are paying for it. That's what Esau was thinking. You know what? Never, never question the judgment of God. Even before they were born, you know, they was making atonement in Rebecca's womb. And she went out and prayed. And she said, the elder will serve the... God said, the elder will serve the younger. That God's ordination should have never been questioned. And, and so we find then that really what they were fighting against and what they were woohooing about was not necessarily that Israel was being defeated. They thought, they thought the judgment of God is unfair. You know what? The judgment of God is always just. We may not understand it, and we may question it in our hearts, but somewhere, somehow, the judgment of God is always just, and it's always the best plan to go with. Yeah. Verse 13. Thou shouldest not have entered the gate of my people in the day, that their, in the day of their calamity. Yea, Thou shouldest not look on their affliction in, in the day of their calamity, nor have thou laid hands on their substance in their, in their day of calamity. Now, I want you to see that the Bible uh, names the day of calamity three different times. Now, if the Bible says it, it's important. And if the Bible says it's three, says it's three times, it's noteworthy. In the day of their calamity, Esau was not a friend. You know what? I don't care who it is. We can, uh, when you see calamity come on somebody, you can go help them. Uh, you know, uh, I've noticed this. The uh, Amish put us to shame on that. Mm -hmm. You watch one of them's house burn down, it'll be going one, another one going up in two or three weeks. Because uh, they centered in on someone's calamity, their, their destruction, their problems. And so we find that instead of standing with Israel, as soon as Taman's people destroyed them, they went in there and took their stuff. So we find that was the nature of his people. Verse 14. Neither, neither shouldest thou stood in the crossway. Now, I'm assuming they were blocking the advancement of escape. But I want you to remember, we don't need to stand idle in the crossway. When we have decisions to make, seek the face of God, and then go in the direction he tells you to. Now, we didn't have many crossways when I was going, growing up. We didn't have an automobile, so I knew Carlisle pretty good. And the closest thing we had to a crossway, and some of you will know it, Cumberland City Road comes in uh, right there by the Three Wheel Church, and just a little hair up from that is the road that goes over here to Long Creek. 
And they don't meet exactly, you have to go like this, but that's near as a crossway as we had. Now, if you were coming south from Dover, to get to Cumberland City, you had to make the left, and to get over to uh, Long Creek area, you had to make a right. And when I was a boy, there was a huge sawmill on the Long Creek Road, where people call it the Carlisle Road. And there was all kinds of trucks and stuff making that big turn and they'd swing way out in the other lane and, then, and turn and go to the sawmill. See, they had a place that they had to be. And you know what? I fully believe this. You have a place where you're supposed to be. And don't you waste time in the crossway. A lot of people waste their entirety of their life in the crossway. Which way do I go? Which way do I go? Well, I'm scared. Well, you know what? Everybody's scared. Amen. Get over it. Move along. Find the will of God and go with it. And you know what? I really don't believe it's much the will of God uh, to simply sit and warm a pew. Find the will of God. Make that turn and go with it. And you know what? God don't, you know, he trains us for a reason. You may turn down, and if you turn and go to Carlisle, what, if you go on Carlisle Road, it's not very far to you what you got called is Eden Way. And that's on your left. And then you got another decision to make. Now, Eden Way sounds really good, doesn't it? Man, going back to Eden. Well, that's as far as from Eden as you can get. The, rope, the, the hills are just like this, and uh, only the only land that's worth anything, the road runs through. Rattlesnakes as big as my arm back in there. See, that can be deceiving, can't it? Eden way. You have to make a decision, don't you? Now, if you keep going, you come to, you, you come to the Long Creek Road, and you head right, you take Maple right, and head toward, back toward Dover, you hang a left, and if you stay straight and hang in the left, you'll end right up in Erin. You see what I'm saying? You got decisions to make. Most sovereign grace Baptists don't want to talk about decisions, but this is reality. After the Lord saves you, you got some decisions to make. Are you going to serve him or not? Are you going to follow him implicitly, or are you going to follow him about halfway? See, sometimes you have to make a right, and sometimes you have to make a left, because God don't want you in a standstill. And very, very frequently, that's what we do. We stand by idle for years and years and years, and we wind up about 80 or 90 years old, and realize we're still at the crossroads after all these years. And that that is not pleasing to God. Don't linger. Go with me to Genesis 19, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. Genesis 19, and we're just going to read one verse for time's sake. Genesis 19, we're going to read verse uh, 16. Genesis 19, verse 16, if you know your Bible, you know this is where... Uh, God, I believe God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and God, the Holy Ghost, came down and delivered Lot from the, the corruption that was in Sodom. See, you can read this about Sodom, and you can read it again in Romans 1 if you want to. Those men was burning for men, and their women was burning for women. Sound familiar? And, and, and so we find then that God's merciful person went down there to get him out. Isn't it a wonderful day when God brought you out of sin? You know, we're pretty disgusted with that sin. And, and I understand at some point, because that's what the Bible says was a sin God hated. Very unusual word for the Almighty. And, but at the same time, you know what? Sin is sin. And, and we need to turn away from it. We need to avoid it. He, you know what? Sometimes the way the reason he may make you take a left to Cumberland City is to avoid the problem further down the road. 
See, he, he's got a plan for you. He's got something in store. All we need to do is simply be obedient, and God will bless us. So we find, we find Lot at a crossroad. Now, if Lot had stayed still, he would have been under the judgment of the Almighty. He left. Verse 16, but look how he leave. And while he, meaning Lot, and while he lingered, the man, and that was a portion of the Godhead, laid upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful into him, they brought him, they brought him forth and set him without the city. Now does that sound like that you that that Lot made a decision to follow God? Does it sound like he made a decision to follow Jesus? You can go up the road in here, and they'll tell you make, to make a decision to follow Jesus. But the way I understood, they grabbed Lot by the arm and literally drug him out for safety's sake. Yeah. And all three of them too. And uh, <laughs> you know what the Bible says concerning Mrs. Lot? It said she looked back. Uh, so we find one direction we don't need to go. And we don't need to go back. We only turn around and redo this thing. So we find then as God's people, we need to always make clear decisions that we're going to serve Christ. That, that he's going to be the first thing that we put. Now go with me to Genesis 43. Genesis 43. And we're going to just read verse 10. Genesis 43 and verse 10. Genesis 43 and verse 10, the Bible says, For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned this second time. So I want you to see that uh, they had left Egypt and what had happened is it was during the drought when Joseph was raised into power. And his daddy and his brothers got hungry up there in the mountains. Remember the first time he said, go down there and get some food. Go buy some food. But see, when you're just buying something, it'll run out more. It'll eventually run out. And, and so they, they were abiding in the mountains still. They ran out of food. And the second time, he says to Reuben, go get us some food. And he said, I can't go because that, that person down there, that ruler down there said I couldn't go unless I brought Joseph with me. And finally he said, take him. See, when, when you're a desperate and we can say, no, I won't, but you won't know till you get there. When we're desperate, we'll even put our children at risk. You know what not coming to church does? It puts your children at risk. Yeah. You know what not coming to church does? It puts you at risk. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we find that finally Israel made this decision, and he sent him down, and they locked him up. They locked up all 11 of them. And so, back to this verse, the problem was that he lingered. He ran out of food. You know what you're going to do if you don't come to church, don't show up, and you linger down there at Bump of Smells, and you linger at Big Rock, and you, and you linger over at Oak Grove? You're going to get hungry. That's what lingering does. That's why, well, should I go this way? Or should I go that way? You know what? I fully believe this. If you'll seek the face of God, he'll tell you. Yeah. Make a right or make a left. But God will lead you and then move on. You know, I, I don't understand why people w won't go forward in the service of Christ. It's just like, okay, I'm saved. Forget about it. That's not what the Bible teaches. Now, uh, I want to go to the book of Judges. And we'll find a young man that learned a lesson about lingering. See, sometimes 
The only way that God's people learns a lesson is learning the hard way. Uh, Judges 19 in the very first verse. Judges 19 in the very first verse. We find a problem. And it came to pass in those days there was no king in Israel. You know what? If you don't have a good church leader, you've got a big problem. We need a leader. Now, I don't want to be domineering, but the day that I don't have a plan for this church is the day, Larry, you laid off. I don't know if the church gives a layoff slip, but if your, church, if your pastor's not leading you, that's what he needs. Very hard, ain't it? Very difficult. But we find in this day, this is the very same day that's covered, uh, you know, when the days when the judges ruled the land. That means the parliament, what we would call our Supreme Court in the United States. The judges were ruling the land. Now, you say, well, Brother Larry, what's the problem? Well, judges wasn't the way that God planned it. That, that's the problem. And so we find there was no leadership in that day. And it came to pass in those days there was no king in Israel, and there was a certain Levite. What does that mean? He was of the priestly tribe. He should have known about God. He should have been a leader. He should have been a man that understood the truth. There was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, a concubine is someone that you don't think enough to marry, but you'd like to shack up with. And that's what a concubine is. You know, in a concubine, you don't necessarily even have to leave a part of the state. Pretty much all you had to do is feed them. A concubine. Now, you think about it, well, praise God. You know, I've been, I've been married to Donna 32 years. I don't have me a concubine. Well, do or I not? What about my job? Could it become a concubine? Get more of my attention than Donna does? I believe it could. Could your wife get more attention than the Lord God Almighty? I believe she could. And when she does, she becomes a concubine. See, this is first. We don't like to think about it, but your relationship with God is first and foremost. And it, it, as long as you keep it like that, everything else will fall into place. So he was violating the law of God and he was shacked up with this woman. Verse 2, and his concubine played the whore against him. Played, uh, played, uh, played the whore against him. So he didn't necessarily get what he wanted, so she was, she was leaving, played the whore, uh, and the only thing a whore is that I know of is one that runs from man to man to man to man. And, and so we find that this woman wasn't, wasn't much to deal with, and his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. Now, what do you see the problem there? He stood at the crossroads for four months. Now, if Donna left me, I'm going wherever she at, wherever she's at, and find the problem. You see what I'm saying? Apparently, he didn't love her enough. To, or, or maybe he stood there, well, maybe she'll come back. Maybe she'll come riding in on a horse. Maybe she'll walk back. Maybe she'll, she'll remember the error of her ways. Maybe, 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 maybe. And four months later, she still went back. You see, he should have made a move the first time. When you get away from God, make, make the first move. Go, go after him. Look for him. Search him. You know, every time that you find in David's life, even in the time that he took Uriah's wife, when God struck him, he began to repent. And, and so we find the end of he, uh, he wasted a lot of time just sitting around and waiting. And I think about sometimes how much time do we sit around just waiting 
when we should be up on the move. And her husband arose and, arose and went after her. That's noteworthy too because he knew where she was at. And her husband rose and went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again to his servant, uh, to having his servant with him, a couple of asses. And she brought him unto her, and, excuse me, and she brought him unto her father's house. And when, her, when, and when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. Now, can you imagine the strangeness of that? Here's a man shacked up with my daughter. And I also want you to notice, she must have not been in his house either. Because it said he found her. Then they went to the father's house. So the father was no more of a disciplinarian. The father was no more of a provider. The father was no more of a protector than the husband was. And, and, and so he found her. And then they went to the father's house. And when, notice, uh, notice what he says. And the father rejoiced to meet him. <laughs> that sounds like today, don't it? Somebody, let me ask you, me and Donna shacked up for four months, would you have rejoiced to see me? Any father of any sense wouldn't have had, would they? I'd say, boy, who do you think you are? Right? This father, oh, great, I'm glad to meet you. See, uh, parenting's changed, hasn't it? Right. And so we find then another era, instead of being corrected of his ways, the father-in-law <laughs> treats him like a brother. Uh, and the father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him, and he abode with him three days. So they did eat and drink and lodged there. Now that sounds friendly, like a family reunion, don't it? But what a what is a Levite supposed to do? He wasn't supposed to have fellowship with heathens, right? He he wasn't supposed to have fellowship with people that were not Israelites. Remember the preacher, and I think it was maybe in uh, the King's Day, and, and he was walking through, had a message. And God had told him, he said, don't you go back. You keep walking. And this other preacher came up. I'm a prophet as well. Hang out with me. And it cost him his life, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I want you to see, for us to make a, a, very, uh, a very deliberate decision to, to stay with people that don't belong to God, we're turning the wrong way. He had no business in that house. And I want you to see, he, should, he was there for three days. Living it up, drinking food, and woo-hoo, this is good. Listen, we don't need to sit at the world's table because the world is going to give us a bunch of junk that we don't need. And so we find the man did this as well, three whole days. And it came to pass on the fourth day, that they arose, meaning the Levite and his wife and this man that he brought with him, when they arose early in the morning, that he arose to depart, and the damsel's father said, uh, said unto his son-in-law, comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterwards go, and afterward go your way. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, that finally God's people were headed out. And the enticement was of this flesh. Something to eat and something to drink. I also want you to see, um, they called it a morsel. That's a very small amount. So that tells me it doesn't take a whole lot to turn God's people away. Just a little morsel of bread. You know, uh, <laughs> Back in the 60s, what the hippies called money was bread. Yeah. See, it'll, it'll turn you away, wouldn't it? it? It will make you do things you didn't think you would ever do. And, and, and so we find then that this man, uh, this individual, supposedly his father-in-law now, so maybe they got married somewhere in there, I don't know. 
And uh, now he says, just stay for a, a morsel of bread. Verse 6. And they sat down and did eat and drink, both of them together. For the damsel's father had said unto the man, be content. Now that's the next road you don't need to take, is the road of contentment. You know, it, it's very much a contentment to have what you need, isn't it? And I'll go further. This is the danger one. Because I believe the Lord God has promised us to have what we need, don't you? Now, the problem is, we don't know what we need. What does the Bible say that was our needs? Food and raiment. Be there with content. That ain't even a roof over your head. Could you be content with that? Everyone in this room would have to say no, would we not? Yeah. I couldn't be content with that. I couldn't think about Adon and the girls and Joey being wet tonight. It's fixing to come another downpour. No, we have a big issue with contentment. But I want you to see the road that he should not have taken is the road that he, he took at this occasion was to be content with the world. Remember, he was still hanging out with heathens. He was still hanging out with the world. He was still hanging out with the things that belong here in this evil world. And his father-in-law's invitation, just be content. You know what? We're pretty content with that, are we not? Well, we're, we're pretty happy with what we got. We need to be careful about the, uh, the problems that exist with contentment because very frequently they'll lead to a spiritual disaster. Tarry here all night and let thine heart be merry. So he gave him two invitations. One was to contentment and the other one was to be happy. Now, whether we're saved or lost, you know what? This world will make you very, very happy. You know, if you ever, uh, and, and, and I don't mean to talk, but uh, y'all remember that little house that's over here where the cemetery is now? Um, it's about to cave in, y'all remember? And, and the church talk, talked about making the prophet's quarter, quarters, and we finally thought it was too far gone. And so we had it tore down. Now, that little house, if you remember, it wasn't very big. And, and maybe the living room was as wide as this space between these two walls, uh, these two windows, very small house. And I remember going in there as a home health nurse, and there literally, literally was a TV that went wall to wall. And the house falling in around it. I'm like, I couldn't afford, afford that TV if my life depended on it. But you know, they got contentment out of it. I remember that old big TV set at an angle because <laughs> the floor was caving in under it. But they got contentment, didn't they? That TV took them out of this world and showed them all kinds of things that were out there. They received contentment. And, and so I want you to see that you be very, very careful that, that you don't stay in the, in, in, the, even in the wrong place for too long. And that's exactly what this man did. And then, in and, uh, verse 12, And his master said unto him, we will not turn aside, uh, I'm sorry, verse 11. And when they were by the Jebusites, I'll get it right in a minute. Verse 10, let's get, read verse 10. But the man would not tarry all night, so he'd had a third invitation. Now we're on day five. What's the number of five? Grace, right? Now we all want, woo, 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 grace. But notice this, but the, the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and departed and came over Je Jabus, which is Jerusalem, and there laid with him two ash and there laid with him two ashes saddled, his concubine also with him. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, what was the problem? Now if you read all of verse 
12 there, or verse 10, excuse me, there was another invitation to stay. But what did he do? He spent the whole day getting ready to go. Yeah. Does that sound familiar to you? Remember, Lot was like, oh yeah, I'll go with you. And why yet tarried that had to drag him out? And here we find a very strange situation. He waited and he waited and he waited to dark to make his decision. See, I think there's a lot of us waiting to dark to make our decision, don't we? And listen, I don't mean a decision for Christ. I mean a decision or how, how you're going to serve him. Wait, you know what? You may wait too late. And you may be pushing the daisies up over here. And you're still wondering, oh, I'm at this crossroads. What am I going to do? Go with God. Go with what he's instructed you to do. Listen, if you don't hear from God, I'd make my calling and election sure. Because he speaks to me nearly every day. And you know what? Any child of God, he should be speaking to your heart all the time. Verse 11, and when they were by Jabus, the day was far spent. And the master said, and the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, and let us turn into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. Now, see two big problems. Who's leading who? The servants leading the master. The servant is making the decision. You see, while we're at the crossroads, don't you make the decision, wait for the leadership of God. See, <laughs> and I kind of feel sorry for the servant because that sorry leader probably would have never made the decision. You know what I'm saying? So the servant meant well, but God wasn't going to use it because it was against the law of God, and this was the, the years under the law of God. The servant was subject to the master and not the other way around. So this master was getting scared and said, won't we go in here to this city? The second problem I see, they went into a heathen city, the Jebusites. It was less safe than his heathen father-in-law's house. It was a very, very, I'll even go this, it was a fatal decision. They turned into the Jebusites, the little land. They found a place to stay. And boy, you know what happens next. They drug that little concubine out. And you, you know the decision he made makes me sick. Because they were sodomites too. Mm -hmm. And they wanted the ruler. And he shoved his wife out there in the middle of that mess. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Well, you, you say, no, man, I, I would I protect Donna to the end. Listen, you get out there and make the wrong turn, you don't know what you do. Do you ever think about that? Get so far from God, you don't hear from him, you don't know what you do. So he shoved his wife out in the middle of that mess. They uh, raped her all night long. She was able to crawl back, and she died on the doorstep right where they were at. And then he realized what he'd done. He'd made a wrong turn. Remember what he did with the, with the body? He cut her up, took her back to Israel, and laid the 12 pieces, one at each tribe. See, he learned a lesson. But it was way too late, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah, that little concubine paid the price, didn't she? When the whole time that Levite could have protected her. You know what? E e even more, he could have married her to start with. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think that? Just make her your wife. Mm -hmm. Levites could have wives. Elizabeth was wife to Zacharias, wasn't it? So they could have had wives. And then finally, he let that little woman's testimony, let her body be a testimony against sin. See, this morning you may be at a crossroads. The Lord may be dealing with you about preaching the gospel. Amen. 
he he may be dealing with you about where where you need to plant the next church. He may be dealing with you about how cold you are to the things of God. I don't know what your need is this morning, but a group this size, I know that we're, there's spiritual needs somewhere. We need to quit waiting in the road and simply do what God would have us to do. Yeah. 